everybody. Welcome to the Daily Debrief on this Wednesday evening. Let's go straight to the so-called McStay family murder case in California. Defendant Charles Merritt faces a possible death sentence if he's convicted in the killings of a man, his wife, and their two sons. The family disappeared February 4, 2010, and for a time, authorities thought they may have simply gone to Mexico. Their bodies, however, turned up buried in the Mojave Desert in November 2013. One year after that, authorities arrested this defendant, Charles Merritt, a former business partner to victim Joseph McStay. Merritt's DNA is on the steering wheel and gear shift of the McStay family vehicle found abandoned near the border. But the defense says that's because Merritt and McStay shook hands at a restaurant before the family disappeared. Right now, live in court in California, the brother of the victim, Mike McStay, is on the witness stand. They're showing photos from inside the family home. And again, folks, the relevance is that Mike McStay said this defendant refused to enter the home with him. This was after, of course, the family was reported missing. Let's go back in for live testimony straight from California. By the way, um, the 13th was the first time you'd ever met the defendant, that, to your recollection? Um, Yes, sir. That's, I believe that's the first time I've ever met him in, in person. And at the time on the 13th, did you have an opportunity to see any vehicles that he was driving? Um, yes, sir. What kind of vehicle was it? It appeared to be an old SBC truck, white truck with box utilities, utility bed. Or harbor bed, whatever you want to call it. You said an SBC? It looked like a, a, a former um, Southern Bell truck. You know, they were white on the chassis and utility bed on the back with lights on top. You know, like telephone company. Gotcha. Type truck. Gotcha. Let me show you exhibit number 401. You recognize the vehicle that's depicted in that photograph? Yes, sir. How do you recognize it? That appears to be his or the vehicle at the time. Can we go back to your project, Mr. Jackson? I'm going to show you number 402 and 403 kind of simultaneously. Do you recognize what's depicted in those two photographs? Is that number 402 now being displayed? Sorry. You're not familiar with the number is. Is that number 402 now being displayed on the projector? Um, that's the same okay. picture. And that would be the uh, driver's side rear, right? Uh, yes, sir. And then number 403 was the passenger side rear, right? Correct. Was there anything else about the defendant's behavior when you went into the window to the office that stuck out to you? Um, not really, not at that time. Did he go into the house with you? I don't believe so. Did he give you a reason why he didn't want to go in the house? No, sir. I don't believe so. What do you see when you go into the house? Um, the front door or from the window? From the window. Describe it, of course. Okay. Um, when you, well, his, the back of his chair was immediately after the blinds, so I believe I was pushing the blinds into the, something. Um, and then as you walk through there, um, as you go through his, the header of his door, 
small little hallway. Continuing straight is the garage. On the right is the downstairs bathroom. To the left, you go to the kitchen and the family room. On your way into the family room, you have your stairs going vertical. You have your egress, your front door. You have your formal dining room on that other side wall, um, which is where you saw the lumber, the, the harbor floor. Did you notice anything significant when you walked in and walked through the house? Um, it looks um, just lived in and I'm kind of a mess. And, um, I knew they were remodeled, but there was drawers out and stuff, you know, displaced. Did you see any painting supplies? I did. What kind? Um... Well, I saw blue tape on certain spots on the floor against the, the uh, island and the linoleum floor. Um, different spots, um, I think the door jam. Um, and then I think, I don't remember, there was, a, there was a paint can or something. Somewhere right now there was a paint can or something like that. Uh, do you recall telling detectives that you saw a paint tray? I did see a tray as well, yes. Where was that? I don't recall. I around the island somewhere. Did it appear to have been freshly painted to you? The, the island? Anything in that in that house when you looked around? Um, I kind of thought that the island was painted because it matched the paint that was still in the little tray. And, but... Okay. Did you notice any food out? Um, I get my, it's been so long, I get my, my times of being in the house confused. Um, I believe, I knew I saw, um, popcorn bowls. Where? Um, in the, um, the family room on the futon. Um, Um, somewhere over by the, um, the oven, I saw egg, eggs out in the carton. Um, when I saw the, the you know, popcorn bowls out, I just thought it was strange because um, there was no cover on the on the chairs. On the chairs, or yeah, you can see the pillow cushion. You can see the the, the cushion. And no covering on it. You mentioned the, the popcorn bowls were by the futon. On the futon. Okay. Was it the futon that didn't have cover or the chairs? Um, the backs where you would lean back on the pillow. Something. On the futon or on a right. chair? On where the boys would lean back. I didn't see that on, the, on that. On that. Would that be the futon you're meaning? The futon makes like an L. Okay. Okay. Uh, it looks like a miniature sofa type thing, and the bowls were just sitting right on where you'd sit, and then you have, I guess, a total of four pillows, one, two, three, four, the bottom two, the one, and two, the three, and four, number three and four didn't have a, no, no cover. It was strange at the time, but I was looking for contact details. On... Your first pet, when you go through the house, where do you actually go? Do you go through the entire house? I don't remember if I actually went upstairs that that time. Did you go in the garage? I can't recall. What happened next? What do you recall doing next? I was looking for phone numbers um, or something, so I was opening cover doors in the kitchen, thinking there might be a you know, contact, you know, grandma, you know, whatever. Um, I believe I either opened the slider to say, hey, come in or whatever, you know. Um, I don't remember if I went to the front door or not. Okay. You said come into the defendant? Yeah, yeah, like, I wasn't on the group, but, you know, when I went through, 
went over to the slider and I'd open it as I was looking around. I don't want him to standing outside the room. So, so I didn't come in? No, he did not. That's when he, he said, no, 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 I'm good or whatever. Did you say anything else besides, no, I'm good? No, sir. I don't know. So. In your initial walk into the house and looking for phone numbers and your brother, did you see any phones? House phone, cell phone? I can't recall. What else happens on the 13th? Anything? I remember... Well, I read my notes, uh, or whatever that paper is. Um, I do remember going neighbor to neighbor, asking if they've seen anything. My brother, were, you know, at this point, we're a little concerned. Um, I knocked on, my kids and I, actually, have, we uh, knocked on neighbor's doors to see if anyone had seen my family. Did you get any positive feedback, leads, information? No, sir. Not a, not a soul? No, a song. Okay. One of them. Um, no questions. Um, actually, I, 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 don't, I shouldn't say it. I can't. My days are confused. Okay. Yeah. Well, at some point, did you get some information from a neighbor? Yes, sir. Okay. Whether it was on the 13th or the 15th or whatever, was is it significant to you in your efforts to find your brother? Um, yes, sir. And what was that information? Um, the, the neighbor had said, I can't remember which, I might have been the one to the left, um, in the cold is that, that they had saw a work truck or something in the park there. Did they give you a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, they kind of described it like a work truck. Okay. Did they give you a time frame of when they saw this truck? They couldn't remember. Okay. Did, I mean, but could they even tell you uh, uh, that they'd even talked to your brother or met your brother or the family? Um, a, a few of them had commented that they'd met the family when they moved in, they were sweet and all that, but that's about it. Okay. Did that information the neighbor give you cause you any type to do it. We are listening to live testimony in the so-called McStay family murder case that's happening live right now in Southern California. This is the case against Charles Merritt and one of the victim's brothers is on the stand right now. Randy Zellin is an attorney. He's joining us for some analysis right now. So, Randy, the big point that prosecutors are trying to make here is that the defendant was acting strangely when this brother went to the house to check on the family back on February 13th. But is this really a big point? I would flip it on cross-examination. It's actually the victim's brother who behaved unusually by deciding to go into his brother's house through the window. And my cross-examination would center around the fact that reasonable people don't typically enter someone's house through a window. That's not really an accepted way to go into someone's home. And that if you didn't have permission to enter the house as the brother, because your brother was missing, so he's not home, the defendant didn't have permission to go into the house. Why in God's name would the defendant, or anyone for that matter, want to enter into someone's home through the window? So here, the pragmatic part of me says, this is simply prosecutorial insecurity. You want to just make sure that every possibility is covered that the defense may try to hold on to. And the cynical side of me says the prosecution has some witness timing issues and they need to drag something out mm -hmm. so this way their next witness will be ready. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so in other words, if the defendant was acting in a strange manner, it might have been because he was hanging around somebody's house watching somebody else going through the window. Of course that's a strange situation. Yeah, but the strange situation is, uh, and, and particularly when he was the testimony of going door to door, uh, did you see anything unusual? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I saw someone entering into the home through a window. Hello? That's the unusual that, that's thing. That's the part. That, well, well, look, let's see how this wraps up if, uh, if we get into cross-examination here uh, in uh, short order. But look, we're going to take a quick break. We will be back in a few minutes with more live testimony from the McStay family murder case from Southern California.
Welcome back to the debrief, folks. We're going to bring you right straight back to the McStay family murder case out of Southern California, where Michael McStay, the brother of victim Joseph McStay, is testifying about entering the family home when Joseph McStay, his wife, and their two children were missing, frantically looking for them, seeing no signs of them in their home, no signs that they had been overtly harmed, and then going throughout the neighborhood, asking neighbors, have you seen Joseph? Have you seen Summer McStay? Have you seen the kids? Let's listen back into this live testimony. Uh, so it started a, a chain reaction, but at some point he ran a check on the car, or somebody ran a check on the car, and said they had found it, it, was been, it had been towed on the 8th as being abandoned from somewhere down by the border. Did that concern you? Yes, sir. Why? Summer would never take the boys to Mexico. She was uh, too, she commented about this. So, so, and my brother and I had surfed there years ago, and this is not as safe as it used to be, so just, so that was a very strange fact for you. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> When's the last time you were down that way? Um, one or two years after their disappearance, I went and did a job in Tijuana for a skateboard company. But that's the last time I've been there. About before February of 2010, sir. When was the last time before February 2010? High school days or maybe before I moved to Kauai in 95. <clears throat> Um, in the information you provided to Deputy Tingley, um, did you provide him some information that the defendant had given to you during your contacts with him? Can you rephrase that? That was a bad lawyer question. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I don't understand that one. Did you tell Deputy Tingley that the defendant had said certain things to you about your brother's PayPal account and email account? Um, I'm not sure. Would it refresh your recollection to look at the report from Deputy Tingley about your conversation? Yes, sir. We're going to review the first two paragraphs on that page to yourself, please. We get a Again, folks, we're listening to the so-called McStay family murder case out of Southern California. The witness on the stand, Michael McStay, is the brother of victim Joseph McStay. Joseph, his wife Summer, and their two children were found dead, buried in the Mojave Desert after they'd been missing for several years. Mike is going back and reviewing previous uh, documents to refresh his memory here in this case. And uh, he's been testifying into the evening here, East Coast time, afternoon there on the West Coast, where this case is occurring about checking on his brother, checking on Summer, checking on the children at the family home, going in through a window, and where prosecutors are trying to go with this is that uh, the defendant was with him and acted strangely. Let's go back into Testimony Live. I don't remember. It's been a long time, but I, would... <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Isn't it true that you told that continually? <laughs> that the defendant told you that his PayPal and email accounts had not been accessed since the 4th? I guess so. I, I don't remember um, saying it, but I would trust those statements more than the, those records. Isn't it true you also told uh, Deputy Tingley in that interview that my brother's best friend and chief engineer for the company hacked into 
Joseph's email and PayPal account. There's no foundation. It doesn't appear that it's a precious memory. It's impeachment at this point, Your Honor. Oh. Well, we were really going to ask if you said that. Did you say that? I must have if it's in the, the document, sir. And you identified that best friend and chief engineer as Charles Merritt or Chase Merritt, correct? Yes, sir. And that's what you understand. And again, ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Keller here for you on the Daily Debrief as we listen to that live testimony in the McStay family murder case out of Southern California. Criminal defense attorney Randy Zellin is still here with me in studio in New York to talk about what's happening. Look, this is difficult. This is a family member who lost his brother and his brother's family. And we're trying to watch prosecutors paint this picture that this connects the defendant to the crime because the defendant was with the brother. Again, the defendant was involved in the family business, and he was acting strangely when Mike, that witness, was trying to get in the family home through a window. I, <laughs> and, 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 what, and you're what, shaking your head. What, what, what they're selling, they're not buying. I, I stand behind what I said earlier, but I'll add something. It may very well be, and this is not fair, but this is not a fair fight. They are waiting for him to break down in front of the jury because the prosecution, I guess, feels better torturing this poor man and having him fall apart in front of the jury. So they will hate the defendant that much more because this is still a case where there's not a whole hell of a lot connecting the defendant to the victim it's other than a little tiny nuggets here and there it's it's, it's all he was acting crime. bizarrely he it was is yeah such a heinous crime and they don't have a confession and they don't have the strength of the dna evidence that they like they don't have the video it's a circumstantial evidence case so let's prejudice the defendant wow those are strong opinions randy zellin appreciate you joining us on the debrief tonight here on law and crime all right, we're going to wrap up the Daily Debrief. For those of you watching on the Law and Crime Network, our live coverage of this trial will continue again after this break. We will say goodbye to you, uh, those of you, rather, who are watching on Cox Media Stations. We'll be back with the Debrief tomorrow at 5 Eastern. Stay tuned if you're watching Law and Crime.